Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Market Snapshot Jerky webinar. Today's presentation will be 15 minutes, followed by five minutes of Q&A. If you have a question during the webinar, type it into the questions pane. You can ask a question at any time, and we'll keep track of them for the Q&A. To answer our most commonly asked questions in advance, we'll be sending out links to the on-demand webinar and the slides to everyone who will attend today's webinar. They'll be available a day or two following the webinar. And now I'm going to hand the microphone to Scott Campbell, today's presenter. Hi, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, just to start out today, I grew up uh, here in uh, the place where Meter Group is uh, headquartered in Pullman, Washington. And as a kid here in rural Washington state and also having parents who hated uh, network television, um, magazines and newspapers were really my uh, mirror to the out, my uh, window to the outside world. And one of the publications that we got a lot at home was Consumer Reports. And I used to love pouring over the different analyses of cars and vacuum cleaners and washing machines and seeing how the different brands ranked and seeing all the data that they gathered on the different products and uh, which earned the ratings of best performing and best buy. And uh, we've been involved in the food processing industry for over 30 years now. And we've learned a lot about the meat snacks industry, partly because of our water activity technology. Um, and meat snacks, as you know, have expensive raw ingredients. They have strict USDA regulations. And um, water activity typically defines the most profitable level of moisture for meat snacks. So a couple of months ago, based on this consumer reports approach, we decided to buy uh, around $1,500 worth of jerky at different stores in our area and test the brands using analytical devices. We tested products for weight, we tested their water activity, and we tested their moisture. We found a lot of really interesting differences between their brands and their approaches. And we also learned some things about how the industry can improve. So um, the opportunity for improvement is pretty clear. Uh, the jerky market nationally exceeds 150 million pounds per year. And if we just take a uh, cost of $6.50 per pound, and uh, our data show that uh, the rate of overfill in packages is around 2%, is above 2%, and the uh, rate of overdrying means that uh, it was also a little higher than 2%. So if we take those numbers and just multiply them out, the total market opportunity for improving operations is north of $50 million. And so that's a really big number. That That is how much people could avoid, um, how much operators could avoid spending on raw materials by nailing their package weight and their moisture content on every batch that they make. So let's dive into the data because um, there's a lot of really interesting uh, information that we were able to, co uh, to connect, uh, or sorry, to collect. So what we see, and the first thing we're gonna say here is we are um, hiding the brand names of the products that we tested. These are actually trade names on packages that we have here. Um, the different brands are identified by letter. Um, so uh, brand F beef original, that had the lowest water activity of any uh, package that we tested at 0.622. And then we run all the way up to 0.852. Um, brand A extra tender um, was the highest water activity that we saw. And so the first thing you'll see here is that there's a huge spread in terms of the water activities that these products uh, show up at the store as representing a, a lot of different approaches in making product. And in some cases indicating that the process control isn't particular, uh, particularly high. Um, this also means that there is just um, as, a, as an overall trend, there is too much water being driven off of these products. And uh, the, this is an opportunity for process improvement, partly because water is a cheap ingredient for a company that, that buys raw materials at six or seven dollars a pound, but also because many consumers prefer softer jerky product. And if you're able to increase your water activity, you can increase the supple or um, the uh, tenderness of that jerky. 
So all things uh, being eco equal, you can see that the water activity numbers, um, that there was a huge spread in these uh, brands that we bought. And you, as, you, as you can see, we purchased 31 different products. We purchased 12 different brands. And uh, these gave us the, the uh, materials for our tests. So we can see some, some groupings here. Um, one of the groupings um, is this uh, low uh, uh, water activity, these low water activity products. And you can see that many of them are from uh, the same brand. We have these uh, relatively high water activity products. And again, you can see that, that these are also from a similar brand. Um, and then um, the one brand, brand A, uh, had three of the four highest water activity products. Now, um, when we look at these data relative to their moisture contents, um, and this is a graph now of uh, moisture content on the y-axis and water activity on the x-axis, you can see something really interesting. Um, the first is that most of the samples tend to be clustered around what, what is known as the isotherm. So the, the isotherm is the relationship between moisture content and water activity. And um, in the, the case of these jerkies that we're measuring, it's something of a straight line. It's slightly curved, but it's, it's kind of a straight line. Each jerky based on its formulation and the um, meat that's in it is going to have a slightly different isotherm, but you can see they're mostly clustered around this area um, of, uh, you know, say a 0.6 water activity with a moisture content of 16% all the way up to a 0.85 water activity with a moisture content of 35%. So there are a, a, a lot of different uh, um, measures, or sorry, a lot of different uh, results that we can see uh, from these measurements that we took having to do with the different brands. Now the brands are actually clustered by color. So let's dive in a little bit and see what those are. Um, this brand H uh, tends to have relatively good control. You can see that, uh, you know, I'm calling good control that they would have um, a tight, that the spread would be pretty tight on the X axis. The y-axis doesn't really matter because, um, you know, except in cases where we're talking about moisture protein ratios, um, the thing that's going to determine whether the product is shelf stable is water activity. So pathogenic bacteria can't grow below 0.85 water activity units. And so we want to see a water activity in level in that range. This brand H, all of these blue dots here are spread out from about 0.76 all the way up to 0.81. Um, and they're spread pretty tightly. Now, if we look at a different brand, brand F, this is what we don't really want to see. Um, here is, is a huge range of water activities. So the lowest water activity product here is, is below 0.6 um, in brand F. And you can see that, that the highest one is uh, almost 0.85. So here they're not really controlling their process using water activity and they're missing opportunities to have a more consistent product and to also um, they're missing opportunities. They're drying off moisture that they could have sold in many of their products. Um, so you can see one brand that uh, that is this um, brand H that is uh, probably, and we don't know for sure, but we assume that they're controlling using water activity because most of their products end up in the same range. And then brand F that's not doing that at all and missing a lot of um, moisture that they could have sold in their product uh, because they're not doing that. Um, another brand here is brand A. This is consistently the highest water activity brand and they don't have any examples of samples that we pulled that were below 0.8. So they have very good process control and they're hitting their numbers on batch after batch. So just, um, you know, these aren't internal data. These are just data we pulled from testing product in the store, but you can see the effects of um, uh, focus and process control on a uh, company's results. Um, so let's move on to talking now about overfill. And overfill is an interesting problem because um, it represents a balance. Now, when we were talking about moisture and content and water activity, the balance was having enough water in your product that it has good organoleptic properties, that it has high profitability, that you're not drying off water that you could have sold, but not having too much water 
um, that would, you know, so much water in the product that, that it would support pathogenic bacteria growth. Here the balance is different. For, for overfill, when you want to nail your package weight, what you're looking for is um, consistency and the ability to put enough uh, product in the package, but not too much. Um, and if you're not able to control your process well, um, putting uh, too much in the package gives away product to the customer. Some of our uh, customers literally call it giveaway. Um, you're giving somebody something that's not in the listed weight, uh, the label weight on the bag. But if you uh, put too little in the bag, then you risk your uh, consumer reputation and you also risk being fined by regulators uh, based on violations of uh, weights and measures uh, regulations on um, and things like max allowable variants. So for our different brands, and we had a number of them here, um, we're again looking at what um, level of, uh, of overfill they were able to achieve. Now, um, the statutes are pretty clear on this uh, relative to what companies have to do. They have to have an average uh, in each batch that, uh, of, so if you average every bag in a batch, that average must not be lower than the labeled weight on the bag. And no individual bag may be below the max allowable variance for the bag. Now, you may say, what's max allowable variance? It is uh, listed in these tables provided by um, regulators. And uh, the max allowable variance depends on what the label weight of the bag is. So they have this little table. You go and find the label weight of the bag that you're making and the max allowable variance, um, which is a low variance, you're allowed to put as much product as you want in a bag, but you can't have um, you can't have too little in the bag, and that too little amount is defined by the table. So if we look across the brands here, uh, what we're seeing is that there is um, a, a lot of variability in, um, in in the different brands. So brand A again has very tight. Um, uh, variability. You can see this band here. Um, and their average is right around the um, zero mark for overfill. So they're doing a really good job. Brand C is also pretty good with their averages, but the variability is extreme. So th this is a less consistent process. And as we go and look at these different brands, uh, brand D is an example of a, of, um, a brand that that's average is, is uh, significantly higher than their package weight, and so overfill is um, is a, is a significant issue for them. In in fact, most of these companies that you can see here um, have averages that are above uh, that are above the label weight for the bag. The only exception is this brand K, who is really um, dialed down their process to the point where um, they're underfilling every bag. And we we didn't look at the specifics on there, but it's possible that that these are actually in, in violation of, um, of uh, regulations because their average weights for their batches may be below the label weight for the bag, which is uh, a definition of, of a um, of uh, non-compliance. So um, so what we see here is that uh, there are some brands like brand A who have very consistent results. Most of the other brands overfill bags because their processes are not uh, consistent. And then we have one brand that that is underfilling bags, um, which is a, a, a potential um, regulatory issue. So, um, but uh, again, these are just um, data that we were able to obtain from buying the product at the store. Um, so let's see. Um, another interesting thing that we found here, uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, uh, another thing, interesting thing we found here was that teriyaki was by far the most likely uh, flavor to cause overfill. And we have a theory that this is because the pieces tend to stick together. And so it's hard for the combo wear to, to make its way through a batch of teriyaki more than it would be like an original or a spicy beef jerky product that doesn't stick together. But by far, this teriyaki flavor was the biggest offender when it came to overfill, which we thought was a, an interesting conclusion. So to wrap up, what recommendations do we have? Well, the first recommendation um, that we have for you is if you're a small jerky maker, use water activity and work with us. You know, we're, we're happy to, to consult with you on these, on these things. Work with us to find the best way to use water activity measurements 
to get variability out of your process. Getting a water activity meter and setting up and starting to take records and just monitoring the uh, day in and day out values that you're getting in your batches costs less than $10,000. And so for most jerky makers, that's that's a, an investment that's gonna pay for itself almost immediately. Um, and it's something that anybody can do and, and we're happy to help. Um, the other recommendation that, that we have is that um, if you're a big jerky maker, partner with a technology company that can make your legacy machines smart. So Meter Group is a, a company like that. That's why we're, we want to highlight these, uh, potential, these potential opportunities for saving money in the jerky industry. But, you know, these conversations around, well, why are, you know, why is the smokehouse process not nailing the moisture number? Or why do combo wares not spit out the right amount of jerky for each bag? This is because um, this is the opportunity to improve exists by making these uh, machines, which are the ones that you already have smart. And that's something that we'd, uh, that we'd you know, diving into the details of those solutions, that's for a different webinar, but um, we are using data to make better decisions and making your legacy machines smart are things that we'd love to talk to you about. Thank you, Scott. Um, we're going to take a few of your questions. We have uh, time for a few of them. And we've also got a couple of people here. Um, uh, along with Scott, we've got Mary Galloway. She's the lead scientist in our food lab, and she's here to take questions specifically about how the jerky market snapshot study was conducted. Um, also, there's still time to ask your questions by typing them into the questions pane, and we'll get to as many as we can before we, we finish here. So, Scott, the first question here, um, can we get a copy of the data you collected for this study? Yeah, so um, if you would like to get the complete data set for the study and you've attended the webinar, just send us an, an email and we are happy to provide that uh, that for you. And you can see who the different brands are. We didn't call them out by name on this on this slide deck, but, but you would be able to see in the data set who those companies are. Uh, so just drop us a line and we'd be happy to share it with you. Um, next one, why does moisture content vary so much at the same water activity? Okay, um, that's a really good question. There are two main reasons. The first has to do with the formulation of the product in terms of what spice blends and, and uh, marinades are being used by the different jerkies. Uh, things that are high in sugar content can hold more, uh, have higher, I mean, it's not, it's not water holding capacity, people would say that, but they can have higher moisture content, but still have a reasonable water activity if the salt or sugar content is particularly high. So talking about sweet varieties of jerky like teriyaki, they can have higher moisture content than a, than just a, a regular uh, original, especially one that doesn't have a lot of salt in it because the sugar is lowering the water activity. Um, the other thing to think about is that um, the raw materials themselves affect the water holding capability of the product, you're likely to see higher uh, water activity, or sorry, higher moistures at the same water activity for products that, um, you know, for example, uh, have not been frozen before they were processed or that are uh, processed fresher as well. So um, the way that the meat itself has been treated prior to uh, the um, uh, to the production of the jerky does affect um, the water the water activity or sorry, the moisture content that you're able to achieve at that same water activity. All right. Um, if everyone measures water activity, why is there so much variability in the product? Yeah, that that has to. That's a question that we have asked ourselves for a long time, and and um, that's one of the reasons why, as a company, we're pushing more into the technology side. Is that you know, our customers don't necessarily want water activity readings. What they want is a consistent product. And typically that requires us to be out in the production area, um, taking readings and also helping people monitor their processes so that before a product is over dried, we can say, hey, let's let's uh, stop this uh, smokehouse run right now because you've nailed the moisture that you want. You know, th most of the times, the reasons why there's so much variability is that is that companies are completing the entire run taking the batch into the QA lab and then finding out when it's too late that the product was over dried. And so it's really a technology challenge. How do we get the data to the point where in the process where the decision is made? And uh, that's uh, uh, so that the process can actually be controlled and influenced. And that's really what we've been working on with some of our software initiatives. And that's what some things we'd be interested to talk to, to um, clients about. 
All right, uh, we've got time for one more question for Scott before we switch over to Mary here. Um, and we'll get a double question in here. Um, is overfill tied to the quality of your equipment? Uh, similarly, does correcting over and underfill just require more sophisticated machinery? Um, this also is a, is a good question. It can be tied to the equipment, but it can also be tied to whether the equipment knows, for example, what product it is uh, working with at a particular time. And uh, so buying more sophisticated machinery can be a, a way to address um, overfill in packages, but um, it is possible that the machinery that you have right now is functioning fine and you just need a better way to send orders to the combo wear. And uh, that requires some knowledge of process. It requires some knowledge about the specific product you're making, like I said, and it also requires some uh, knowledge about the specific machine. Each of your machines is gonna behave a little bit differently, even with the exact same settings. And so being able to characterize that, having the product uh, context when the decision is being made, and then having live data from the check wear, all those things are critical to being able to hit your overfill number. And it's possible to improve your overfill number a lot without changing out and, and buying more sophisticated machinery. All right, Scott, thanks. Um, we're gonna switch over and address a couple questions that came in from Mary. Um, let's see, Mary, one of our listeners is asking, um, how did you test water activity and moisture content in these products? So just kind of your basic nuts and bolts of the process here. All right, thank you. Um, yes, what we did was we purchased um, packages uh, from local stores of different brands of jerkies, different flavors, and also online, hoping to get a good representation, a little snapshot, but of of uh, different plants where they were produced, different lot numbers, that kind of thing, uh, thing so that we could kind of get a, a little more varied in our, in our uh, information that we were pulling, uh, a little more global uh, look at everything. Um, from there, uh, we purchased three bags each of each of the flavors. Um, so that was, um, we had 12 brands and 31 flavors. And so we tested a lot of jerky. So three bags of those, so nearly 100 different packages of jerky. Um, we, uh, from each bag for the water activity, we made three subsamples there um, by cutting them up and getting a good representation of the bag, tested the water activity three times. Uh, for each of those subsamples, averaged all of that. Um, we looked specifically at the different flavors, different brands. We had it all broken down, but then we also averaged that for the uh, slides that Scott showed. We averaged all of the data for the different flavors for each of those. And we also, um, when he was talking about for the brands, that was all of the flavors flavors, brands, packages, all of that was averaged together to get a good overview. Um, for the moisture contents, uh, for each of the packages, we um, made two uh, similar where we're taking cutting bits of the different pieces of jerky to get a nice representation of the bag. We made two subsamples uh, of each of those. And what we did, we, we used loss on drying, which is where you put in the oven, we put them in at 100 C and then dried them down so there's no change in moisture loss anymore. And then we calculated the moisture content based on that. And so the same idea applies there as the water activity where we're averaging the data, we've got standard deviations, that kind of stuff. And then we, um, depending on how we were looking at the data, if it was um, the flavor or if it was the brand, then we were averaging those data. And then for the overpack, um, basically we would measure uh, the package um, whole and intact, and then we would dump out the contents and weigh the contents and the bag, and then also um, take into account what is pr printed on the bag, so uh, the bag weight, and so then um, depending on how those measured up, we would get a percent of over or underfill for each of the packages. So. Awesome. All right. Um, looks like we have time for one last question. Um, this one goes toward food safety here. I thought 0.85 was upper limit for water activity. Don't those high water activity jerky samples get moldy? Okay, so this is a little bit more of a complicated question um, than it first appears. Um, I just want to explain where the 0.85 uh, upper limit for water activity is from. Uh, that is um, based off of what we call potentially hazardous foods. If you have a water activity above 8.5, you're in a zone where you can potentially grow um, hazardous microbes like uh, salmonella, E. coli, 
um, botulism, um, fun things like that. So we call those potentially hazardous foods because you can put people in the hospital and they could potentially die. So it's very scary. So we have that limit of eight five because if all other things are um, in ideal situation, that is the lowest water activity that they can grow. So that's a proven um, <clears throat> limit there of 0.85. So uh, there are um, ways that you can have a slightly higher water activity um, and still maintain um, that lower microbial growth so you don't wanna get those potentially hazardous microbes growing. Um, but the problem is, uh, so let me give you an example. Um, you can actually lower your pH and then uh, in, in response, you can actually increase your water activity limit. Um, so if you have a pH of 0.52 um, or below, you can actually have a water activity level as high as 9.2 and still not um, have an environment where those potentially hazardous microbes can grow. However, um, and this is a big however, you have to have an extremely tight process um, that you're controlling that and you have to prove that you um, are uh, limiting those microbial growth. So um, if you want to make sure that your product is always going to be safe no matter what the other conditions are, then that's why we have the 0.85. You will not have any trouble if you are that or below. Now, mold is slightly different because it is not a potentially hazardous microbe. Um, it's not desirable, but it won't put anybody in the hospital. It might make them feel a little ill, but it, it's not potentially hazardous. Um, so my, uh, mold can actually grow at a lower water activity limit. Um, and that's generally, you know, on the um, 0.7 range around there. Uh, with all of ours, uh, um, the packages we tested, we didn't find any trouble with that, even with the, there were some that were close to the 0.85 um, water activity. However, um, once we opened the packages of the ones that were a little higher at the 0.85, they molded very quickly within a day or two, which surprised us because generally on the package it says you have three days to refrigerate or consume. So um, that is a little concerning. So I just want to point out that, that th those limit and the mold is little, slightly different things, but um, it is something to be aware of because, um, you know, if you are in the, trying to operate in the higher range, you need to be aware how tight your control is on your process and being able to maintain that and, and know really what you're doing. So, Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, that's the last question we have time for today. Um, if you submitted a question that we didn't get to, we'll have our team follow up with you by email within the next day or so. And again, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did. And thanks for such great questions. Scott did mention that the study data are available to people who attended this webinar live. Um, if you'd like to see that data or if you'd like more information on improving control of your product, water activity, your package weights, um, please reply to the follow-up email. And that email will also contain links to the recording and the slides. So stay tuned for future Meter Food webinars and have a great day.